Good evening and welcome to the third and final hearing of the Iowa 2021 Temporary Redistricting Advisory Commission. I'm Sue Lairdall and with me this evening are the commission members, David Roeder, Ian Russell, Chris Hagenau, and Jasmine Newton. Mr. Hagenau is having some issues on the computer, but he can listen. He just might not physically see him tonight, but he will be listening in. We have three hours together tonight with three minutes per speaker. We welcome written comments as well. That is actually stopped. We have um, received them all and uh, we stopped receiving those tonight at six o'clock to allow us uh, to absorb them before tomorrow's meeting uh, that we have scheduled as a commission. We expect perfect technology, but in the event technology disagrees, we appreciate your patience. You will receive a 15 second warning to allow you to finish your sentence of thought. I reserve the right to disconnect the speaker if inappropriate for tonight's purpose. We appreciate the work of the legal staff and the computer staff of the Legislative Services Agency due to scrunch time of the census data and the decision to do this by virtual hearings, as well as your time to share your thoughts in accordance with the redistricting requirements found in code section 42.4. An explanation of the redistricting process can be found on the legislative website. Greater information regarding members and the Legislative Services Agency process will be offered at the commission meeting tomorrow at four o'clock. Given the timing of the release of the first plan last Thursday, September 16th, the commission's report needs to be completed by September 30th. The special session is scheduled for October 5th when this will be considered. Um, I would wanna add one more thing that has come up in the past that the commission members are appointed one each by the Senate and majority and minority leader and the House majority and minority leaders. And then those four appointed me. So just so that's clear. Um, with that, we will start with our first speaker. Mackenzie Bill. Okay, Mackenzie, thanks for joining us tonight and feel free to start. Can some, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Bills. I am from Altoona. And I first wanted to say thank you to the Legislative Services Agency for doing an outstanding job in redistricting the four congressional districts, 50 Senate districts, and 100 House districts in such a short amount of time, only 35 days. Iowa is the gold standard for redistricting nationwide. Iowa law is fair, ethical, and nonpartisan. Um, and unfortunately, in this day and age, that is rare to find in our political climate. The current maps highlight current populations and migratory patterns within the state. Polk, Lynn, and Johnson County skyrocketed in numbers, while many districts in western, west and southern areas of the state decreased. It is only fair and frankly democratic to have the maps representative of that. It may cause some elected officials to move, retire, or compete against other incumbents, but that is what our democracy is all about, competition and equal representation. Every vote matters here in Iowa, and this map will ensure it is. I hope that the Iowa Senate, Iowa House, and Governor Reynolds remembers this when they go, go to vote in early October. Thank you for your time and effort to ensure our democracy remains representative of the people in a fair and just way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mackenzie. We appreciate your time and your thoughts. Uh, the next speaker, please. Paul Uzel. Okay, Paul, good to have you here. Thank you. Can hear anybody else? Give your hand if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Great. I don't know what I'm supposed to say, but I'll just say my piece and get out of your way. How's that sound? You're That's not in our way, but go ahead. <laughs> um, I am in uh, basically in favor of the redistricting map as it has been laid out. 
I find the shape of district, uh, Congressional District 2 rather curiously like an old uh, drawing I saw of what the gerrymandering is all about, a dragon kind of a thing that was looped all around. Maybe you all went to school and saw that. But the, the, besides the shape, uh, it was done by a nonpartisan group, and I very much appreciate that. And I would not lose Iowa's place. I am not exactly pleased that Dubuque is no longer in the same district as Lynn County and Johnson County in the Quad Cities. We have much more in common with them than we do Story City or uh, some other places. I suppose Waterloo is at least in the same district. But um, that be as a mayor may not be, I would definitely support the districting thing. And I would be open to any questions you might have for me, but you're gonna have to write them down because I can't hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, we're not, we're just receiving testimony tonight. So um, do you have anything else to add? I didn't hear a word you say, Sue, but thank you very much anyway. Well, thank you so much. Um, if could I we have get out speak? of the meeting, just go like this and wave. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Paula Conley. Paula. Ms. Conley, are you there? For 30 years, specifically moving three years ago to Des Moines to rehab a 113 year old abandoned home. I am here tonight. Yes. You hear me now? Yes, I am. Okay, here Paul, we need to disconnect Paul, okay? I won't say. Okay, LSA staff, can you um, disconnect Paul and reconnect Paula, please? This is Paula, am I reconnected? We can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this public hearing. My name is Paula Conley. I have lived in Polk County for 30 years, specifically moving to Des Moines three years ago to rehab a 113 year old abandoned home. I am here tonight to voice my support to continue the longstanding history of our state's unique method of drawing a redistricting map. The nonpartisan approach in the law using a strict set of criteria and the prohibition of the use of political data as part of our decision-making process has served us well. Historically, I believe the Iowa process has drawn districts that are well-balanced, yet diverse, and allow Iowans with a variety of lived experience to be well-represented. Well represented. I urge the commission to look at the specific growth in the greater Des Moines area. I have noticed more and more people moving into my neighborhood as well as neighborhood neighboring counties. In fact, the most recent census data shows that the third congressional district is over population by about roughly 8%. I support the compactedness guideline that was followed and evident in the newly released maps. I want to continue to live in an Iowa that honors fairness and takes into deep consideration the population growth of the greater Des Moines area. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Conley. Do you have anything else to say then? No, I do not. Okay, very good, thank you. Could we have the next speaker then, please? Jenny Turner. Ms. Turner, your turn.
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you for listening to our comments tonight. Uh, my name's Jenny Turner. She, her. I live in West Des Moines. I was born in Iowa and I grew up here. And nonpartisan redistricting is a model for the country and one of the things about Iowa that represents our best features, fairness and common sense. When I look at this map that um, you all put out, I see common sense. It's common sense for the Des Moines Metro to be in the same district together. My mother who lives in Bondurant and my in-laws who live in West Des Moines, five minutes from my house, but they're in Dallas County, are in the same district with me and that just makes sense. I do want to point out that our urban areas have been continuing to grow at a much faster rate than our rural areas for quite a while and that this trend will surely continue. So we need to be making sure to represent our people equally as that growth trend continues over the next decade. Again, other states and groups advocating for fairness and transparency in voting hold us up as a model and I ask you to please continue that proud tradition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have anything else you'd like to share? That's all. Okay, very good. Thank you. We have the next speaker, please. Keenan Crow. Keenan, glad to have you here. the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, it's always easy to look at the end result of a process as intricate and complex as redistricting and poke holes in the output. Uh, maybe the map pits two beloved incumbents against one another or splits a geographic area that had previously been politically unified or even just seems oddly shaped. But what is sometimes more difficult to do is to see the benefits of such a neutral process, even when considering the individual political challenges that it may pose. But that's exactly what this legislature did back in 2011, and it's what every Iowa legislature has done since this nonpartisan process was adopted in 1980. The first map was accepted in 1991 and 2011. The second map was accepted in 2001, and the third map was accepted when the system was first utilized in 1981 without amendment. The map that we have in our hands today is a fair map. It is not a perfect map, but there is no such thing. It is a map which conforms to the requirements laid out in Iowa code and will ensure that our state is politically competitive for years to come. So in closing, uh, we urge the legislature to look past any differences of opinion or political challenges and come together to support this map like so many other legislators have done for the last 40 years. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much. You have anything else to add? Okay, we'll have the next speaker then. Chad Brubaker. Mr. Brubaker, welcome and please begin. Small points, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the first is that this map is unequal under Iowa Constitution Article 1, Section 6, Equal Protection and Iowa Constitution Article 1, Section 20, Petition Assembly. Uh, voters in Council Bluffs under this map are going to have essentially twice the number of ballot petition signatures required to get a candidate on the ballot. Uh, this map, therefore, is not fair under the Iowa Constitution, will probably be struck down by the courts if it goes to that. Uh, my second point uh, is that the LSA needs to show its work in generating these maps. Um, Hopefully the LSA is using, you know, all the nice modern software algorithms that we have to generate fair random maps, you know, just based on the census data without any human uh, hand editing. And that uh, going forward in the second map, uh, the LSA shows each of its hand edits and explains them. So there isn't any uh, color of bias in the process. Uh, the third concern I have is structural is that the LSA does not have, to my knowledge, a way to prevent ex parte communication from the Attorney General's office. Uh, the, the executive branch does have such a ban under Iowa Code 17A.17, but I'm not aware that LSA has such a ban. Um, I know that in violation of Iowa Code 685, the Iowa False Claims Act, Iowa Solicitor General Jeffrey Thompson failed to give uh, the LSA notice as required by law of a $100 million taxpayer recovery action going on right now. 
Um, I'm not. I, I'm Mr. really worried. Okay, Mr. Brubaker, we're you know, if you could kindly stick to the redistricting topic, that would be good. Well, the, 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 this is a, this is a structural issue that the, the, the LSA needs to find some way to not have ex parte communication with the attorney general. That should be in the public. And my last point, uh, that there is a $21,000 payment from the Iowa GOP to Bell and McCormick on the 23rd of March, 2019, uh, incident to Susan Larson Christensen, our Chief Justice's brother, Jeffrey Thompson, sorry, Jeffrey Larson, being form shopped into the 5th Judicial District to quash a subpoena on Iowa State Police to talk about financial irregularities at Iowa State. And we Mr. have Mr. Bru Mr. I'm going to I'm going to take the liberty of cutting well, you off. The, Do we have the next speaker, please? Garrett Arbuckle. Thank you, Garrett, for joining us tonight. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I want to thank the panel for this opportunity and all of your hard work in drawing these maps. I am a college student in, from Woodbury County in the Sioux City area, and I just would like to voice my concerns with the drawing of the map and how that affects the college electorate, especially in Woodbury County. According to the 2012 and 2016 National Study of Learning, Voting and Engagement Report, also known as the NSOL report, there is a 10% difference in voter registration rates versus vote actual votes cast, ballots cast when it comes election time. And there are multiple factors that can contribute to this, that being that voter registration in many on many campuses happens actually on campus and voting a lot of the times does not happen on campus in certain areas. For example, this our area, we have a residency that is being cut off by some of the maps in this area and it is just by one street one block that this this residence hall is separated from the rest of campus which is leading to inconsistency in voting patterns for these this this sub section of the college electorate there are issues when it comes with splitting this and with transportation and access to the polls among college students and a lot of the times this is the first experience that college students have with voting in elections. And in order to have the university and colleges help in the education and aspect of getting out to the vote, the get out the vote efforts, I think that it is important that the accessibility of the polls is there for the students because of whatever barriers students may face in getting to the polls. With that being said, I think that this split forces students to also have to re-register time after time when it comes to the years, which can lead to inconsistent numbers in voter registration and voter participation, which can ultimately lead to dissuading students to vote. And the way that this map is drawn is that it around our specific area in Woodbury County is that if the map was just moved, if that line was divided just one block sooner, that would be allowing that residential areas of houses, apartments, and the general population to be consistent with other general populations and the university divide to be consistent, one, with the campus of the university and two, with the with how the other maps are being drawn in across the state of Iowa. Again, I want to thank you for your time and your your ability to listen and take feedback on this comment. Okay, thank you very much. The next speaker, please. Christian Leonard. Christian, please begin. We're, we're glad you're here. Can you all hear me? We can. Okay. Hello, my name is Christian Leonard. I am a lifelong resident of Iowa, hailing from the small town of Logan in Harrison County. I am also a current student at Morningside University in Sioux City. Last year, amid an unprecedented pandemic, my university took the initiative to increase voter turnout, provide resources for students to educate themselves on any candidate they were interested in, and host a satellite voting site on campus. Unfortunately, the way the districts are drawn has hindered our ability to increase voter turnout and help students find the correct resources they need to successfully vote in an election. 
Currently, my campus is split in two, with one of our three residence halls being placed inside of a different district than the other two. This residence hall is the largest on our campus and houses around 400 students. It is quite difficult to advocate for voting when half of the campus is voting in a diff for different candidates, reforms, and issues than the other half. I am quite displeased, as are many of my fellow students here at Morningside. Let's be practical and approve maps that don't hinder voter turnout for so many students who are just beginning on one of our most sacred civ civic duties, voting. For many, this is the first ever election they will vote in, and if they can't make their voices heard over something so simple as moving a line back one street to encompass our entire university, I fear many will stop caring and never vote in the future. Please reconsider these maps and make the changes for those residing us residing here in Sioux City. I also would like to bring up the um, uh, how Harrison County is split up as well. Um, Logan is kind of split off. Um, I know that the county is split into two. Uh, it's a population of about 14,000 people. Um, and our um, values and um, ideas in our county do not match up with the ones we are districted in uh, with. We are more closely aligned with Monona uh, County that uh, is put into the different district, which we're split in half from. Um, so that also is concerning um, maybe to please consider relooking at how Harrison County is drawn up um, to put us with more of who we vote with and who we have the same ideas as. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can we have the next speaker, please? Valerie Hennings. Ms. Hennings. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you so much. Well, good evening. My name is Valerie Headings and I live, work and vote in Sioux City. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the LSA as well as the redistricting commission for all of your efforts to ensure that our redistricting process here in Iowa is nonpartisan and remains model to other states in our country. Uh, I'm here to call your attention to a concern that previous speakers, including Garrett Arbuckle and Christian Leonard, uh, wanted to bring to your attention about uh, State Senate District 1 and House District 2. This happens to be uh, within the heart of Morningside University's campus in Sioux City. And uh, when it comes to the proposed maps that you've shared with us, uh, this would continue to split the on-campus undergraduate student population in half. Um, when it comes to thinking about the potential implications of these maps, um, I do want to share that uh, we aren't speaking in hypotheticals. The challenges that both Christian, Garrett, and I want to share with you this evening, these are our experiences. Uh, we have had that, that line down Peters Avenue um, for the past decade, uh, and it has presented a challenge to our undergraduate population when it comes to their first time voting. Uh, unlike perhaps other residents, those who live on campus, uh, they tend to switch residency halls a, a great deal. And the way that the situation is currently set up at Morningside is that if an individual who moves from one dorm across the street to another, they need to completely re-register and they are now in different state Senate and state house districts. Uh, this sort of changing among dorms is quite common among college students, uh, and it can often happen multiple times during an academic year. And it's something that certainly presents a unique challenge to our students here. Um, I, I will say that I'm, I'm very proud of the work that our students have demonstrated in the past 10 years to overcome this challenge, in addition to encouraging new voters to be activated and mobilized in this community. Looking at the maps that are currently proposed, it looks like this challenge will continue for this group of students. I would like to encourage you to think about how this will affect this community of student voters. And again, I, I thank you for, for your work to ensure that our redistricting process, as well as its implications and the decisions we make about redistricting, genuinely serve and support all the voters of Iowa. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We appreciate your thoughts. We have the next speaker, please. Jim Trepka. Mr. Trepka, thank you for joining us. Okay. 
the maps that have been drawn and I really appreciate the work of the commission. And I hope that the leg legislature does its job and um, accepts them as they are. And that's it. That's it. You have many more minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we have a next speaker, please? Steve Woodhouse. Mr. Woodhouse, thank you for joining us. Hi, you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. It's, I'm not used to this uh, group meeting technology on the phone. Anyway, uh, thanks for your time and everything. Uh, I have a couple concerns. Um, first of all, State Senate District 17, when I was looking at that, that looks awfully gerrymandered. It's kind of like a backwards C-shaped. That just doesn't seem right. And uh, as I was reviewing the list of uh, Iowa House districts, it looks to me like about 24 um, districts are just in the Des Moines metro area. And I realize that the uh, map is made based on population, but still, I don't believe it's in Iowa's best interest to have a quarter of the uh, representation at the state house to be located in such a small geographic area of the state. So I think the uh, legislature should revisit that this session. And perhaps um, the LSA should as well when the redistricts look take a look at that. And uh, I just had some questions too about the uh, the size of Congressional District Four. Um, whoever runs that, whoever is elected to that seat, is going to have to represent a very diverse and large area. And I don't really think that's fair because it's going to be difficult for any rural residents in that district to get any attention or anything like that. And uh, my concerns are just basically because there seems to be such a huge divide between the wants and needs of rural Iowa versus that of urban. And I don't think it's going to be balanced enough with this map. And like I say, I think it might take, might require some lot changes to make things a little more balanced to get all of Iowa geographically represented properly in the Iowa House and Senate, as well as our congressional districts. So, um, I believe that was all of my concerns for tonight. Uh, thank you all for your time and uh, you have a great night. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Could we have the next speaker, please? Nick Battles. Mr. Battles, thanks for joining us. Hi. Hi. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure you can y'all hear me. I think there's a little bit of a delay, but now you're halfway through after me. So props to y'all for uh, sticking with it. And thanks for the hearing opportunity. I'm not going to add much to uh, anything new. I'm you've heard a lot of these comments already, but I just want to reiterate my support um, as a lifelong Iowan uh, for the nonpartisan process by which. Um, we determine our congressional districts. It's something to be admired and respected. Uh, indeed, as many people have said, it's a model for all those advocating for fair and equitable redistricting every decade. And I urge the Iowa legislature to accept the proposed map so that, uh, that uphold these um, values of a nonpartisan non and democratic process. Uh, I know the state legislature likes to be involved a lot uh, as much as it can be, but I think the best form of involvement for the legislature is to Continue ensuring that our nonpartisan process is upheld um, so we can avoid elected elected officials choosing their voters um, and have it the other way around in which voters choose their elected officials, of course. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We have the next speaker, please. Evan Berger. Mr. Berger, thank you. Thank you, Chair Lairdall. Thank you, Valerie. Um, my name is Evan Berger. I, I live in uh, Slater, Iowa. And, um, you know, one thing that's new about this redistricting cycle, as you all know, is that, um, you know, computers are a lot more powerful. Um, and there are all these uh, online redistricting tools that just the general public can use, um, you know, in past cycles. 
LSA had had this powerful software, but members of the general public didn't really have access to that. And so, you know, one effect of that is that there's been lots of, you know, draft maps circulating just drawn by interested parties, just everyday citizens. Um, and, you know, I, I'm one of these people, I've played around with these tools, I've, I've looked at a lot of these maps, and really this this map that the LSA proposed is, is the best one I've seen. Um, you know, it's not the most equal in terms of population. You can draw more equal maps than this. Um, it's not the most compact either in terms of length width compactness or in terms of perimeter compactness. Um, you can draw more comp compact maps, um, both on the congressional level and the legislative level, but um, it is the map that balances all of these considerations um, the best of any that I've seen. Um, and, you know, when, when we look at the uh, Iowa Code and we look at the Constitution, you know, these are the three standards that really matter. These are the ones that we have to look at. So, um, population equality, length of compactness, and perimeter compactness. You know, as long as things are contiguous and you're, you're trying to respect political boundaries, like those are the three, three scores that, that we should use to compare maps and that we have to use to compare maps. So, um, you know, I, I look at this map, I don't see a way to do it any better. Um, I think it's, I think it's an amazing uh, result from the LSA. I challenge any legislator who votes no on this map to produce a better map that is both equal and compact on both standards. Um, and, you know, I'm, uh, I have a, a little bit of extra time, so I'm going to get sucked into the, <laughs> the trap of responding to previous um, speakers. You know, unfortunately here in Iowa, we don't have a communities of interest um, sort of standard at all. So the idea that um, students should be grouped together in a in a similar district, you know, obviously it's, that's a relevant consideration, totally valid for people to mention that. Um, you know, I, I am a little confused because, you know, this question of re students having to re-register, that's the case no matter how the boundaries are drawn. You know, if you move from one dorm to the other, if your address changes at all, you of course have to re-register even if that's still within the same precinct. So, um, you know, I think we just got to stick to those three standards that are in, in Iowa code, uh, population equality, which LSA has done an amazing job at. This is a very, very equal map. Um, and those two measures of compactness, they've, they've managed to hit all three of those, those standards. And again, I just challenge anyone who says, oh, this is a bad map. Okay, let's, let's draw a new state. If you can draw a new statewide map that hits that balance um, better than this current map, um, then I'm all ears, but so far I haven't seen it. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, could we have the next speaker, please? Kim Hageman. Okay, Kim, glad to have you here. I live in unincorporated Polk County, and um, when I look at the map, um, it indeed is a big change for um, my household. Um, because we always used to be attached to Ankeny, but we understand that the population is changing, and so the map has to change. I urge the legislature to accept the redistricting map. I want Iowa to continue to be a leader against gerrymandering, and Iowa has developed a model process. No process will be perfect. No map will be perfect. And I know that you're not hearing from hordes of people or people that are super mad, but supporting a fair process doesn't tend to get people to speak out and chant loudly or chant epitaphs at people. So um, I'm here to, to say, pass the map, pass the map, pass the map, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hageman. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Judah Richardson. Okay, Judah.
Are we hooking Judah in? Judah has been unmuted or requested unmute. Uh, the hand is up. Let's move on until uh, we can get Judah unmuted. The next person is Marilyn Hagedorn. Okay, Ms. Hagedorn. Good evening. I'm uh, Sister Marilyn Hagedorn living here in Des Moines and with me is my biological sister also, Sister Elaine Hagedorn. And uh, we have been lifelong Iowans and are so grateful that for 40 years, Iowa's had probably the best reapportionment system in the nation. We think it's best because it ensures fairness. It uses the most recent census data and assigns to a neutral third party the drawing of new legislative and congressional boundaries. This nonpartisan process, excuse the phone ringing, <laughs> ensures that all Iowans have a voice, regardless of our political affiliation. Partisan lawmakers are not the ones who draw the boundaries, they merely vote on them. This first map for 2021 follows this gold standard approach reflecting the changes in Iowa's population according to the census while ma maintaining nonpartisanship with the goal of integrity and unity in our state. So map one gets our strong support. The honest work put forth by the commission is to be applauded. We urge the legislature to approve this first map and continue to make Iowa's reapportionment system a model for the nation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Did, did your sister want to say something too? I think she's answering the phone. <laughs> uh, okay. No, we, we had discussed this and we agreed on all of the comments. And uh, we listened to the three uh, hearings that you have offered to the people of Iowa and uh, it sounds to us like there's a great agreement on map one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, did we get back to Judah by chance or not? Yes, Judah Richardson. Okay, great. There we go, good evening everyone. Good evening. Yes, uh, my name is Judah Richardson. I work for a defense contractor here in Davenport, Iowa, where I live. I run computer simulations for them. However, I'm speaking here now as a representative of any organization, but as a private citizen of the great state of Iowa. Uh, I'm very much in support of the rules that the legislature has that it should approve a plan that meets Iowa's legal and constitutional requirements, including one, districts must be established based on population and the population of all districts should be equal as practicable. Two, each congressional district must be composed of whole counties and a number of counties and cities divided into more than one legislative district must be as small as possible. Three, districts must be composed of convenient contiguous territory. And four, districts must be reasonably compact in form, i.e. square, rectangular, or hexagonal, not regularly shaped to the extent permitted by natural or political boundaries. Now, on this call, I have heard the concerns of, of the Woodbury County residents, and I understand where they're coming from. I would also say they are not the only ones affected by map detail that may be suboptimal for them, specific, uh, with the emphasis on them. But there's a difference between something that is so optimal for a group of people in one place versus one that is suboptimal for the process overall. I do believe that the first LSA proposed map meets the aforesaid standards and is optimal for the process overall. And I'm therefore strongly advocating for their approval and use. Thank you for your time and have a good evening. Well, thank you, and thanks for sticking with us to get you on. I would appreciate that. Um, could we have the next speaker, please? Patricia Bowen. Ms. Bowen, glad to have you here.
Patricia, you are unmuted. Can you hear us, Patricia? Is there a chance she might not have the volume up or something so she can't hear us? Can you work with Patricia somehow and move on to the next speaker by chance or not? Absolutely. The next person is Thomas O'Donnell. Mr. O'Donnell, are you there? Can you hear me? We can, thank you okay. for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, I presume this format does not allow uh, the LSA staff to answer questions, but I am curious about um, the role that um, the depopulation of rural Iowa paid in redrawing these districts. Uh, the people who may oppose this map, um, particularly I presume Republicans who are thrown into the same districts on the General Assembly have to face the reality that population in rural areas is declining. That is where most Republicans uh, are elected from, is rural areas. And so it's going to be natural that most of them are thrown together into uh, dist new districts as those districts get bigger to uh, meet the requirement for political equity, or uh, I'm sorry, population equity. Um, they, if they expect to do better in the next map, uh, they may be fooling themselves. Uh, this process is fair. The map is fair. It reflects Iowa's population as it exists now. Uh, and uh, it's just going to be a political reality that uh, metro areas are going to get more representation. Uh, I, I hope the legislature realizes this and votes to accept this map and uh, follow a process that, as people have said, is the gold standard for the nation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I will take this opportunity to say that um, LSA staff will be joining us tomorrow at the four o'clock meeting to kind of um, discuss um, the process and to answer questions of the commission and have a dialogue. Um, the, um, and there, I don't know if you can see the list online, but there's more LSA staff listening tonight than there are the five commission members. And so I'm sure they will um, put that thought pattern into the remarks that they will share with us tomorrow. Thank you. Um, do we have the next speaker, please, or did we find Patricia? We can go ahead and try Patricia Bowen. Can we try and get you unmuted, Pat? And we do have Mr. Hagenau back with us at, in person. That's good. Pat, you might need to hit, uh, looks like. You're on. Can you hear us? Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay, well, great. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. I, I tried calling in on my phone. Um, okay, my name is Pat Bowen and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a lifelong Iowan having voted here and followed elections for nearly 50 years. And as people have said before, politicians of both parties have loved to brag about Iowa's gold standard process for redistricting. And now it's the chance, their chance, 
to put their money where their mouths are and to vote to approve this LSA map. I'm in agreement with what a lot of other people have said tonight. The three standards that the LSA considered in producing these maps are contiguity, contiguity, population equality, and compactness. And we know the population is changing in Iowa, and we have to address that. That is why we do this every 10 years. Um, I did not think that the standards of producing a map or to put people to match them up in a neighborhood or an area, a geographic area where others vote like them. I didn't think that was part of the um, uh, issues that people looked at when they were making these maps. Um, so I think the population thing was very close. I think it was around 99 people different. So I think that is very good. Um, so my, my last comments would be, Iowa has developed this model process that pulls out as much subjective partisanship as possible. No process will be perfect. No map will be perfect. Please move forward with the map as determined by the process. And as usual, they did it. The LSA did an excellent job balancing population equality with um, measures of compactness. And I urge a vote to approve the LSA map. And thank you for being patient with me to get connected to audio. Okay, you have anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have the next speaker, please. Ellen Johnson. Ellen. They've proposed new districts for Congress with equal populations, not more or less. The team hit their goal and has done well at their role, but their first draft, I hope you'll not miss. This proposed map meets each requirement, not just the letter, but the actual intent. Support plan number one and we can be done. Keep politics out of this and give your consent. In our state, there's no room for partisan pandering. Each district's border is just a bit meandering, but they're pretty compact and I hope you'll quickly act so in Iowa we can avoid gerrymandering. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Do we have the next speaker, please? Brenda Brink. Ms. Brink. It's a very important pop process, and I'm from Roll Huxley, and you can hear me? Yes, we can. All righty. We can be rightly proud of our system which uses nonpartisan guidelines that are applauded across the nation. From my standpoint, there is nothing more important that the LSA does than to ensure confidence in our elections. In this time of heated and often repeated claims of voter fraud, I am encouraging legislators on both sides of the aisle to show their best. Public servants that want to continue to keep Iowa as a shining light of fair unbiased and smart voting processes. By voting for this map as presented, legislators show understanding of the importance of the process and agree that it has worked. A, worked well, B, greatly reduced the cries of gerrymandering, and just as importantly, C, adds to our status as a state that will not tolerate unfairness in voting maps. We have seen the problems that come from those who design these maps for their own parties. Voters in our state have confidence in this process and want to continue to feel that Iowa is a state of opportunity, opportunity for all, not just one party. I urge legislators to support voting fairness and to accept this map. Thanks for this. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, could we have the next speaker, please? Prakash Kaparapu. Okay. Welcome. Feel free to start speaking. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Prakash Kaparapu. Uh, I'm the chair of Indo American PAC, uh, representing a wide range of uh, Iowans. Uh, that participate in elections quite actively. Uh, thank you for the uh, LSS uh, tremendous work uh, within the uh, compressed amount of time that they received. Uh, great job on the first attempt. 
uh, I like math. I'm an engineer, and it was a purely math-driven uh, process. Uh, and congratulations on a very good map. And we proudly support the first map. And uh, uh, we recommend legislature and uh, uh, governor and everyone to get behind this map and move forward. And again, I'm a proud IO one, and I'm so proud of the process that we uh, follow here. And throughout the nation where I speak, uh, I always brag about our, our bipartisan process that we have, or nonpartisan process that we have. Keep up the great work, and I am honored to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? OK, thank you very much. Do we have the next speaker, please? Trent Rendernet. Thank you for your time. I apologize in advance for bringing some negative feedback to you guys. But after looking over the congressional district proposal, I am concerned that they present a lack of equity. The proposed map disenfranchises Iowa farmers in the rural community. And I know you are restricted by counties. So let me give you a few county numbers to uh, help shore up my, my point. Iowa's 15 largest counties account for less than 60% of the overall population, but account for over 80% of the population of two of your proposed districts, one and three. Conversely, those from the smallest 84 counties account for more than 40% uh, of the population, but 70 or only uh, less than 20% of those two districts. Those stark numbers were made possible due to the packing of rural communities in your proposed fourth district. Packing, if you don't know, is concentrating as many voters of one type into a district to reduce their numbers elsewhere. In this case, 70% of District 4 residents came from the smallest 84 counties, a full 30% greater than what would be expected. This has led to two districts where rural individuals have no say. I will be asking my state rep to reject the proposal for a more equitable solution that does not include packing. If the future proposals have the uh, smallest 84 counties who, as I said before, account for more than 40% <clears throat> or just 40% of the overall state uh, vote, uh, if they account for more, if those rural counties account for more than 60% in any one district, I'll ask my state reps to uh, deny future ones as well. Uh, of the, this is how I do it, of the 15 most populous counties, I'd put Scott, Johnson, and Muscatine counties into the Southeast District 1. I'd put Lynn, Blackhawk, Dubuque, and Clinton into a Northern, Northeastern District 2, Polk, Warren, and Potawatomi into a Southwestern District 3, and Woodbury, Dallas, and Story, and Cerro Gordo into a Northwestern District 4. Those districts would be amazingly square and would be the envy of the country. This would produce four districts that contain 52% Rural in District 1, or 52% urban in District 1, 64%, 80%, and 43% of the population from the urban 15 counties a solution, uh, um, across those four districts. A solution that is both equitable to both rural and uh, rural residents. Uh, secondly, I looked over the proposal for state Senate districts, and by and large, they looked pretty good. But I was looking at some of the urban ones, and they looked a little meandering. Uh, it takes uh, Senate District 17. Starts out in Southeast Polk and ends over way past in Dallas County while skipping over Ankeny. It took me about an hour in Excel to uh, create a more compact District 17 that was south of District 22, 21, and 20. My 22 would drop Ankeny through the Ankeny. Yeah, hey, 15 seconds, oh, please. Uh, yeah, so anyway, you can move all those 20, 21, and 22 north uh, and create a, a more compact 17 south of that district. Anyway, um, my one question is how does Lyndon Johnson counties go from Increase in population, yet decrease from three to one in even uh, even numbered Senate districts. That's my main question. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have another speaker, please? We do not. Not that I see in my list of attendees, but why don't I call out the next three names just to see if my list did not update. I have Josh Hughes. Kathy Breimeyer.
Mary McAdams. And that completes our list of speakers for tonight. Did um, uh, Heather Jones call or something and say not she interested did. anymore or not? Okay. Right, she removed herself from the list. Okay, very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, with that, um, I'm glad that we had more speakers tonight than we've had in the past, but I, I do want to not um, end these hearings without the chance of all the commission members to um, have some words. I know we're meeting tomorrow at four to actually have a meeting and talk about it and whatever, but um, uh, if you want to, you know, I enjoyed the process I, to have the public um, tell us uh, their thoughts and um, if you all want to just take turns rather than me calling on you, that'd be great. And um, uh, please feel free to add whatever you'd like. Thank you. Not none of you are shy, I don't think. So go for it. I'll go first so I can say thank you, and then everybody else can say yes, thank you. Um, this process only works and works better um, when the public participates. It's very important that the public's participated and whether you did so by calling a um, representative or submitting a written comment or speaking, um, it, it all helps. And I'm very appreciative of that. I very much enjoyed uh, being, being part of the process. I wanna thank the other commission members uh, and especially Sue for, um, doing all the all of the the speaking at these things and um, agreeing to to chair this. So thank you, everybody. I'll go. I'll go next because I I think uh, um, well I can hear someone coming in the door. But uh, no, I thank you to everyone that participated tonight. Um, really had some great participants tonight who clearly had done their homework and had. Um, Frankly, I think the five of us, it's been a fair amount of time uh, considering all these things and raised some interesting uh, issues that I hadn't even uh, thought about yet. But uh, I thought everything was great. I thought the process was was very well done. I really appreciate Stu and I appreciate a series of uh, speakers tonight with alliterative last names to mine. I don't know if anybody else caught that, but. Um, I did, and so I also enjoyed that. But anyway, look forward to uh, talking about this again tomorrow, and uh, I think the process has worked very well. Thank you. Thank you. Jasmine, you want to go ahead or you want me to? Well, I, 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 Ian, thanks for starting out so I can say I agree with Ian. Um, and also, uh, Chris, the, the, it, it's you're absolutely right. It's 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 much better when we have good participation, and and I really I really thank all those who did, and a special thank you to the people that I can see in my mind sitting there with their spreadsheets and going through each of these districts and trying to figure out how the the numbers go, and if you if you move one one street, uh, which which we, we heard from uh, a morning side that that how that would uh, uh, would impact it. And so I, I really appreciate those who have given the uh, the, the time and effort to uh, uh, to look through these. So thank you. Thank you. I will echo. Um what all my fellow commissioners have said tonight. Um, it is a wonderful process that Iowa has set forth and it is great to see the participation that we have seen both from the people that have spoken at these three meetings, those that have submitted comments um, and those that have likely reached out to their representatives to discuss the proposed map. I will echo what many people commented, um, not just on tonight's meeting, but the other two meetings that Iowa really is the gold standard for redistricting. We have a process in place um, by our constitution and our Iowa code that allows for redistricting that is going to be fair and equitable. So I tonight I feel proud to be an Iowan. 
I echo the same um, comments that many people uh, had regarding how wonderful it is to be in the state of Iowa, the confidence they have in our state. So I, I appreciate that. And I want to thank everyone that um, has been a pro part of this process, my fellow commissioners. It's an honor to serve on this commission, and I look forward to our meeting tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thank Sue. you. Um, Sue. I'm going to ch check back with, oh, Chris, you have something else? I, sure, go for it. Yeah, and I, and I apologize to jump back in on you. I wanted to make one other point, though. I know we had quite a few people that left online or uh, comments on the legislative website, written comments, and I just wanted to make sure, and I think I speak for the rest of the commissioners, that I have looked through those and I will read them all again. There's some really good stuff on there. And I just wanted those folks to know that their voices are absolutely heard and uh, will be considered as we move forward. Absolutely, that's a great point. I wanna check back with the staff to see if any of the four or missing people have appeared by chance. Okay, we had, we had none of the four have appeared. So um, it's been an honor and a pleasure to hear all the public, both written and in person. And uh, I think it's sad that we couldn't do it um, in real person but um, one of these days I'll get to meet Ian and Jasmine and uh, we look forward to that. So until tomorrow at four, we um, I mean, urge everybody to, David? I was just gonna move that we adjourn. Okay, that'd be great. You go for it. Is there a second to that motion? Is there a second to David's motion? I'll second. Okay, very good. Um, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, opposed? Okay, we'll see everybody tomorrow at four. Thank you so much. Thank you.